Um, I, I, I'd be surprised if it went down the avenue of just kind of the biggest player takes all and kind of sweeps up all of the volume. Because I think the the nature of content out there is just so diverse that it's almost difficult to solve for with, with just one tool. Welcome to the Cave Minds Podcast. All right, welcome to the uh, Cave Minds Pod here. Today we got a really special one. It's something that I've been looking forward to. And um, it's actually with on Byword. And we got Mac here, who's the co-founder of Byword. And it's been something that we actually wrote about um, in one of our earlier uh, Future Fridays and Deep Dives, where we kind of featured and talked about SEO within the future of uh, well, AI SEO. And Byword is something that was really cool when we checked it out. And um, and I think, you know, I, I would probably not do it justice as much as you uh, doing an intro on it. So we'd love to, to hear more about uh, what Byword is all about, Mac. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me on, Benson. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Mac. I built a tool uh, which launched about a year ago now called byword.ai. Um, it's, and I, I'll talk about it a little bit more later on, but it's sort of built out of the work that I've been doing for a few years now, since the kind of early days of large language models, uh, using language models to build SEO ready content and to sort of automate a lot of the content creation process that for a long time had been done by humans. Um, I've been kind of doing this for a few years, working as a contractor, working with brands, kind of building like bits of custom tech and platforms to, to build the sort of SEO AI content. And then around about, I think it was early November last year, launched it into a productized version called Byword, where any sort of brand can come along or any site owner can come along uh, with a list of keywords that they want to target from their target audience or a list of article titles they know they want to write. I just plug it into the software and it kind of handles what was the writing, but all the kind of meta fields, images um, with various kind of customizable features and, and syncs that to various different sorts of CMSs and sites as well. Awesome. And then this is something that when did you, when did you guys create Byword? Like what was the, what was that like creation journey and, and what did that look like? Yeah. So it's, uh, kind of depending on how you define it, it's, it could take a few different start dates. So as early as I think mid 2021, I was building custom bits of tech and bits of scripts, um, to work with different sites to kind of produce you know, it'd be a thousand or five thousand articles on a, on a particular theme or format. Um, and it basically, when I kind of moved from each project to the next, was taking a lot of stuff along with me, a lot of kind of prompt structure and a lot of the, the underlying code. Um, and kind of kept iterating on that for, I guess it would have been, yeah, about a year and a half or so. Um, until it was around August, September time last year that finally it, it sort of felt like enough was enough. And I had to build this into something that was, you know, an actual product that was publicly usable. Um, so I think. In terms of Bioware.ai, that would been started building in September, um, early September last year, and put together an MVP pretty quickly. Got that uh, put together over September, October. I, I think the actual launch was was very early November to a, a wait list, and then more publicly. Very cool. And you know what? I think what's most interesting here is like I I, I wrote here in my notes here that I kind of say you're kind of like a, a little bit of man of mystery, kind of Batman in a sense for me, because on the website, personal website, it's like. You start out, like you said, like doing Facebook ads, like paid search expert as like one of your main things. And then like uh, in the bubble feature, which is really interesting to read, was that um, one of the lines that I wrote as a quote here was like he taught himself to write API calls and scripts and developed an interest in the intersection of SEO and, and AI. And then like it sounds like you also know about how to like program and also how to like use bubble to actually build something, which is like something that like you know, it's not something that's part of your main website. So that's why I'm thinking that it's like a secret yeah. skill that you have to like create something like that. Uh, in truth, this kind of background and skills are a little bit all over the place. So back at university, I did physics and philosophy. Um, there was probably a brief period of time where I thought maybe I'd end up becoming a physicist. And I remember going off for an interview for a, a physics internship uh, one summer and sitting in the, in the sort of interview for it. And the interviewer basically assumed that I could code, sort of said, you, you can code, right? So blah, 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 blah. Uh, it turned out I needed to know C++. Um, I had never coded in my life, so I had, I think, two, two, three months to kind of get up to speed on that. Um, so that was the first time I really learned to write any sort of code. And then after that, in the kind of following years at university, we would just kind of mess around with, you know, crappy little scripts and hitting APIs and just tiny little projects, um, but never worked full-time as a developer or anything like that. Um, when I left university, I actually ended up working, uh, as you mentioned, in performance marketing, so running ads, uh, an agency festival, and definitely had a lot of interest in the ad tech side of things. 
one thing that I always find particularly interesting when it comes to like marketing and tech, and particularly like the big ad platforms, if it's uh, Facebook ads or Google ads, is there's often they're not built in sort of a, the most complete way. And there's, there's often a kind of differentiation or, or difference in features between what's accessible on the front end and on the, ba- and on the back end. So basically you could often do cool stuff with the platforms if you knew how to code and write the odd API call. And so, especially like in a marketing context, not many people have technical skills uh, at any level, really. So it was, a, it was often a lot of fun building things and doing things that you couldn't otherwise do just by kind of hitting the APIs and backends and, um, and accessing those extra features. So had built up a, a kind of bit of an understanding of, of some of the technical side of things that I'd carried through some of those jobs in marketing. And then um, I, I, I sort of worked mostly in marketing up until uh, I think it was sort of mid-2021 um, or maybe 2020, the years get blurred. Uh, and I, was con- I, I basically left a full-time job to go contract um, and do a bunch of different sort of contract jobs, doing ads for different brands. And during this time, uh, I was working with a friend startup called Causal. Um, and I was doing a little bit of, well, a little bit of everything on the marketing side, including I was actually managing content writers for a little while. Um, and I think around this time, I'd come across this Zapier, Zapier case study. Um, Zapier, I, I imagine this is my know, it's a sort of integrations app that lets you connect uh twitter to google sheets and, and different apps like that and they have this really cool seminal case study with an seo um one of the kind of big first programmatic seo case studies that was uh the idea is they have lots of apps on their platform um so let's say they have a uh, 100 apps um that not just gives you 100 seo pages once you kind of fill out the meta fields and data for those apps but if there's 100 apps and they all connect together then that's 100 times 99 uh so you've already got nearly 10,000 different pairs of apps and so suddenly just from like populating data for hundreds of apps, you've got 10,000 pages and you can rank on all these niche search terms about how to connect Twitter to Google Sheets where nobody else is uh, producing content. And so you can rank quite easily, get really high intent customers. And I, th- I think maybe it was just the lazy side of me that really liked this idea of putting in a, a little bit of data and getting tons of pages and, and rankings and traffic out of that. And so it was around this time we, we were trying a similar project with Causal. Um, we were a little bit worried that there would be some issues with duplicate content penalties, which is when you have lots of pages that are quite similar and Google says, hey, these are too similar, we're not going to show these. So it was it was pretty much at the time that I remember getting off, you know, people still talk about the GPT-4 waitlist, this was the GPT-3 waitlist, um, getting access to the GPT-3 API, which is very cutting edge at the time, uh, and using API calls that, to that to basically provide unique content for the pages that we're building and to differentiate those. And this was kind of how it all started. Um, and from then on, basically just went, built more and more projects, more and more pages using these GPT-3 APIs. Very cool. I, I think what's most fascinating is that like most people would not in your position think about that. And I think it's like just the intersection of so many things that were happening really well, where you were doing, like you were working on this project. And then I think it, it correct me if I'm wrong, you're working with, with, uh, with Jake on this project with Causal. And then that's how you guys met. And then over the years, like you guys built a relationship. Um, and then at the same time, like you, like people don't like, you know, as performance marker, they don't go like, oh, thinking about Zapier, thinking about Bubble, and then like, oh, also Chat GPT API came in, and then you go like, okay, why don't I like productize or create something that could like make it like scalable, and then like, like not like all just like based on human manual like content SEO stuff, which is how people would most likely strategize for a client. So I think that's what's like most creative and interesting about it. Um, and then how did that like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff at the intersections there because like, I'm never going to be the best programmer or software engineer. I'm never going to be the best marketer, but, um, there's so few marketers that can write any code at all. And so few software engineers that have any kind of sense of marketing and what's important there. And so it, it's usually at those sort of intersections between the two skills. That I think there's most opportunity to do stuff that's cool and unique and other people aren't doing. And do you think that like that? If you were to like give it the perfect recipe or formula like the, of the intersection of things we we're talking about, would you say that those would be like the core ones or what would be some things that you think like as a self-awareness moment that was like really critical for creating Byword and timing and everything? Like what, what would be some of those like key things that you think like made everything like align? Yeah. Um, 
there are a few kind of factors along the way. So one was just being able, uh, because I was doing this as like part of my job and going out to kind of brands and like pitching these programmatic AI SEO ideas. It, it was interesting getting a, like a lot of initial, I guess you could call it user feedback. Um, so like one of the things that really incentivized me to build Byron in the first place rather than just keep doing what I was doing is I remember talking to one Italian startup who basically said like, yeah, we're talking to you and a few other like tools and companies. We like you, but we'd rather just use a tool. Um, so certainly getting that feedback early, uh, and like prompting me to go down that avenue of building a tool. Um, one other thing as well, um, which is, Maybe to some extent, still a bit of a differentiating factor between Bioword and admittedly, there are a lot of uh, other kind of similar competitive products is that a lot of products out there have gone down quite a specific angle in terms of like the volume and the way they're focused there. So there's loads of tools that um, will kind of generate an AI article for you and have a huge feature set that's built around editing that article and kind of repurposing it or like tweaking certain bits or doing kind of like high fidelity, low volume. And so particularly because of the way that I'd come to this through the work that I was doing in contracting. It, it's it's interesting how different bywords being pitched in terms of this is really content at scale. It's trying to produce really high volumes of content, going for the kind of niche intersections of, you know, it's not just like uh, how to start a handyman business or how to start a business in Hawaii. It's how to start a handyman business in Hawaii. So the intersections of the two where you're targeting that sort of content that or those sorts of keywords where there just isn't content there already. Um, and so it's much easier to really kind of clean sweep and get to position one and stuff like that. I think that's what's interesting, like, because I come from a branding marketing background. And when I see like Byward, the position that you guys have is different than other like SEO apps that are like kind of somewhat popping up or what the way that they're selling it. And I think that's a good position to make. And I like that you guys are way more, the UI UX of the site is more and more simple and it's like easier to understand because I think that that's a big selling point. A lot of the, things that are popping up now or even before they're like they're like too techy like they're too fancy in their branding and positioning that i think is actually taking away and it's like very um how do i say it? like they're all, all like look the same so there it's really hard to differentiate but i think when i go on byword like that was one main appeal going from like discovering it from the case study all the way to uh looking through the site and everything that you guys are adding now so that's what's interesting about it yeah, this is just a, a weird, interesting quirk of SEO tech as a space. There seems to be a sort of like prevailing design pattern of, you know, this, this massive homepage and like a certain sort of design standard. Um, and not to say that's right or wrong, but definitely a conscious decision with building by word was like, however it looks, let's just make it different from this because there's going to be a, a, a huge audience of kind of SaaS businesses and startups that, that don't want this kind of traditional, uh, SEO design style and want something a bit cleaner. Um, and a bit sort of minimal in that sense. Yeah, that's true. And, and like taking a little bit of pivot into like, I think traction of like Byward, you know, I was looking at a post that Jake had posted about like the journey to 33,000 users in six months, but I just want to call out some really like, I, I think impressive feats, uh, that you guys have accomplished together with Byward, where Byward has generated over uh, 1.3 million articles in total for, for companies, brands. Of all different sizes, um, two million plus views on social media, uh, being on on podcasts with like like Neil Patel, which is obviously one of the the OGs, and and I personally have done work with Neil and um, and Eric Sue and all these other people from back in the day. Um, mentioned in huge industry newsletters, people made take talks about you guys. That's always a good sign. Hundreds of thousands of views, listed in blogs, uh, great blogs in Ahrefs, HubSpot, and other like key like marketing softwares and titans and stuff and like that's like a lot of great traction like how do you how do you guys like feel about that like where where do you guys are are just like now compared to like where you guys want to be uh what is that what, what do you think about that yeah no, it's definitely been incredibly exciting um to see it getting picked up in all these different places um i think uh, a lot of that comes down to one, the fact that, yeah, it's a competitive space. There are tons and tons of competitors out there, but the ways that we've kind of differentiated ourselves, both um, partially in terms of kind of product and design, but also um, something I, I think maybe touched on earlier was uh, this case study with Causal, um, just through the fact that this is quite a sort of nascent industry. Um, a lot of people, I think, have not gotten into it 
through the same route that I have of doing this for a few years. They've, they've got into it kind of product first. Let's just build a product. And this happens to be where they build it. So they don't necessarily have the, the kind of historical results. Um, and if they do, they're, they're generally because of maybe trust issues that they're, they're, they're kind of not willing to share those results or clients would rather remain anonymous. Um, so I think having that case study as being kind of like the one kind of shining light of, Hey, this stuff really, really works. And we, we didn't really do anything fancy. We weren't kind of uh, writing prompts in a way to avoid AI detection or any of this. We weren't even really using images. Um, it was very kind of basic stuff. And it's, uh, the case study says three quarters of a million. I think for September, we'll probably hit a million sessions a month on those, on those pages. So it's definitely continuing to grow as well. And I think that's been. This is for a causal or byword? Uh, for causal, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Amazing. Um, and then I think, um, I'll also throw it up here too. Like one of the, when we, uh, add this in, but one of the guys that I think was at causal also made like a 30 under 60 second intro about you guys that you guys featured was really cool. I mean, it's always great when someone makes a 60 second, uh, behind the scenes story of you guys on it too. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been, um, so that was Max. There's also, um, I think some of the funniest bits are when you just see a sort of random TikTok where someone is sort of screen recording one of Jake's posts and talking over it. Um, yeah, I, I never expected the, the case study or any of Byword stuff to end up on random SEO TikTok. Very cool. Uh, and I think like, so what, what was it like to achieve those results with them with the app? Like, was that the biggest like signal for you guys or was there like just other case studies? Because that just happened to be obviously the, the best one to position you guys and it definitely like worked out obviously from like a, like a post perspective on LinkedIn and other channels, but like, what was it like to achieve those results? Uh, sorry, do you mean the causal results or? That's right. Yeah. The causal results. Like, was that the one where you guys knew, like once it like you used yeah. the app to build, you're like, okay, we got something here. Yeah. I mean, there's a few factors. So one is like, I've done these sorts of projects for a number of different brands and like some big startups as well. Um, but certainly I, I, I usually signing NDAs before these, these projects because, um, there's still a bit of sort of uncertainty, um, around how people feel about AI content. Um, and so it just happens there was a personal relationship in the case of causal, um, which meant that we were able to kind of to, to share those results. Um, but there's definitely some other very big ones, um, for, for quite large sites that I've done very similar things for. Very cool. And you know, when I saw the, um, the causal one, I think the, my mind kind of went into, and I think this is probably why what we did really well as well is like how much money and time was saved versus having them to hire a full SEO and content team instead. And it's like with the power of SEO and stuff. And like, would you think that that was the top like three to five trigger points for like when, why the positioning of this case study went viral essentially? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I don't have full time tracking of how long it took, but, um, I mean, certainly some of those causal projects we redid when GPT-4 came out, which, which is basically the same as doing them again. And, you know, it takes a, a remarkably small amount of time to generate a thousand or two thousand of these posts, uh, with particular structure. Um, I, I could probably do all of these quicker than I could write one post by hand myself. Um, so it's, it's orders of magnitude and difference of cost and also the time taken. Um, and, and time is such a crucial factor here because it takes time for stuff to rank on SEO. The quicker you can get it out, the better. Um, and certainly with like a lot of causal posts and like a, a lot, the way a lot of brands approach this stuff generally is to not always see the AI content as necessarily being the finished project, uh, the finished product, but say, Hey, we're going to make these 5,000 pages or whatever it is. We're going to put them up on our site and we're going to use this as more of like a signal or kind of seeds to grow SEO. What I mean by that is that we'll put them out and when stuff starts ranking, we'll then go back to those pages that are, you know, hitting position ones and certain keywords or, or getting a decent amount of traffic. And then we'll use this as a signal to, okay, we'll, we'll now pay a human to kind of go through, tidy these up, edit them, brand voice if needs be. Um, and crucially also kind of like have the CTAs flow through to the product or to the sign up page or whatever it is. So it, it's, it's not always a case of just, uh, AI content completely replacing and having this exact same function as like human content would but just being that kind of like initial stage and then you can use the signals and go back and, and build it into whatever you want. So that's interesting because one of the things I, I was wondering about was how you guys viewed Byword in the in the life cycle or the, the funnel of like SEO and content marketing for brand and company and also tying into like feature set, but also the future vision. Like, do you guys see yourself complete, completely replacing this in the next 
you know, with the pace of how AI moves six months a year or in like two, three years, or like, what, what does that look like uh, within like the future of Byword, but also like where you guys position yourselves right now and as that evolves? Yeah, it's a good question. So definitely historically, the focus has been on the more upper funnel side of things. So it's more kind of informational, educational content. The, the idea being this is kind of an easier problem to tackle. It's easy to kind of get traffic in. And then uh, even if it doesn't kind of convert perfectly straight away, you have that signal and it's very easy for someone. It doesn't need to be a particularly experienced human, just someone to kind of go in and, and kind of tweak it and edit it and have it linked through to where you want to send people, if it's product pages or whatever. Um, I do see one of the kind of major, there's a few different sort of strands of development and ways that Byword will change over the next three to six months. But one of them I do see being, um, and this is somewhat model reliant and depending on kind of what happens with uh, open AI models and, and where they develop. But one way I'd definitely like to take it and I've been experimenting a bit with recently is getting it to, um, to, to, to kind of align more with a particular brand or site and being able to take in more context uh, around the where the content's being hosted, basically. So a very obvious example is just getting this to feed into kind of conclusions and CTAs, um, having the article kind of segue more naturally. But we've done a little bit of this in that we've released quite a cool feature recently uh, around interlinking. So this is, uh, it seems like a very easy problem to solve, but it's actually been pretty hard for not, not just us, but kind of everyone in the SEO space is being able to link pieces of content through to other relevant pieces of content uh, at scale and in a way that kind of feels natural and human. And so we took a we took a fairly novel approach here, which I don't think, would, well, it wouldn't even really have been possible six months ago, where we kind of take a scan of a user's site, of the sitemap, and we, we basically go through every single page uh, and we, we embed the content into what's called a vector embedding, which is basically a list of numbers that sort of signifies what the content's about. And so every time uh, a user is is generating a new piece of content in ByWord, we're comparing that content to every piece of content that exists on their site and looking for what stuff is most similar, where it's where it makes most sense to kind of naturally send people to. And then also running props on top of that that look for the best place to insert those links. So it feels very natural to the end user, um, which is not just good from a kind of technical SEO perspective of, of keeping pages linked together, but also from a UX perspective, keeping users on site, keeping them engaged, uh, dropping bounce rates, increasing session times, et cetera. That's the kind of first step in this direction of trying to make content that's more uh, like holistically integrated with the user's site. Um, and, and the end journey of that is kind of having it right down to like the perfect CTAs and kind of selling the user at the right point in the article. That That's amazing. Like, especially like the stuff that you just talked about, I think like things to consider for businesses as like your product evolves and even now, but like that you're definitely hitting nail on the head with some of the stuff that you're releasing. Have you guys had any pushback from any or it may be, maybe not but like people that are in the you know SEO game or people that are, are doing things in basically like human uh, like content marketing like traditionally have you guys had any pushback have you guys uh, do you foresee any of that to be honest I'm trying to think back we haven't had too much pushback uh, maybe some of it comes or touches on what I was just mentioning in that like my word and some of the tools are pretty good when it comes to the upper funnel type of content um, I, I generally don't make any claims about it being great at kind of lower funnel content or, or kind of content that's trying to convert someone um, to a particular product or whatever it is. Um, and I think there's definitely still a, a really strong place for humans in that, whether it's kind of humans writing that first and foremost, or if it's uh, you kind of using Bioware to get a signal and then a human going and perfecting it. Um, but yeah, I think because Bioware's never kind of positioned itself uh, there's always been this focus on generating content at scale and kind of upper funnel, more educational content. It's never really positioned itself at loggerheads with uh, those who, who who feel quite rightly that human written content is best for the kind of conversion focused stuff. You guys are definitely believing in the future of like human with AI versus like AI replacing humans. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's fair to say. I mean, I, I certainly can't predict the future in terms of where the models will go and what sort of development we'll see over the next two years, never mind even the next six months. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what will be possible and how good AI will be at certain different tasks. But I think for the moment in time, it's the combination of both that makes most sense for, for different stages of the funnel and, and different kind of parts of the buyer journey. Okay, makes sense. I'd love to talk more about like actionable use cases for Byword because you guys have now like with 33,000 plus users, you guys have seen a lot. So like use cases for Byword for you know, just different companies, like how should companies be viewing Byword aside from everything you've shared, top of funnel content and all the new features you're doing with interlinking and, and whatnot. And also like that thing where you talked about the vector embedding of adding 
a sight in and it literally crawls like everything. I mean, that is sick. So, but like overall though, like what, like for a software company, for e-commerce brands and like agencies, like how should they, be, maybe if you go through like each of those different categories, like how should they be focusing and kind of leveraging, uh, you know, byword? Yeah, sure thing. So I, I think there's a kind of few different steps on the journey in terms of uh, like how people approach AI content and what they're looking to get out of it. So typically at the start, you'll get a brand that maybe has a sort of like content quota. Um, so maybe they're wanting to produce kind of one article a day and historically they would have gone to human writers for this and they're looking at Byword as really just a kind of like switch in place. So they already have that kind of content strategy and SEO strategy planned out. Um, and this maybe isn't necessarily even kind of focused on like the strengths and weaknesses of AI content. It's just kind of how, how they want to build that content strategy and Byword kind of plugs in and handles either the first draft or the complete draft of that content. I think where it gets really interesting and why I touched upon this earlier is the people who are really using it at scale, not just because it's more articles means more traffic, but because it means you can take a fundamentally different kind of approach. So I think a lot of traditional SEO has been what I've been calling zero dimensional. So it's basically just a big list of kind of titles or keywords that you want to go for. There's not like a kind of parameter. Uh, there's not a parameter in common to all of those keywords. It's just, Hey, I've plugged like my topic or my e-commerce space into hrefs and these are all the keywords that have come out and i want to generate content all of this where it starts to get interesting is when you have uh like dimensional structures so for example um an example of this might be how to start a business in x state uh which gives you lots of instantiations like how to start a business in hawaii or how to start a business in new york etc and here you have a lot of content that ha like has a similar theme so you can package it quite nicely in terms of site structure it goes after terms that are generally, that they might be lower volume, but also much lower competition. And so much easier to kind of rank on these things. And you can really t keep making this kind of more and more aggressive if you're looking at uh, like two dimensional structures. Um, if it's like, you know, not just uh, how to grow plant type, but how to grow plant type in location where you're really getting at stuff where there's just no human that would ever have written content on that because it's not economically justifiable for a brand to spend. 100 or 200 dollars or whatever getting a human to but suddenly like with the unlimited plan on byword it costs a matter of cents to generate each article and so it, it suddenly kind of completely changes the equation of what sort of content is economical to generate now um and you can really target those kind of niche intersections where if someone's searching that thing they're also quite likely to be a little bit further along in their journey or kind of higher intent or, or kind of more willing to kind of read and learn that you know i can see already like if we go pra like one maybe one layer deeper like for SaaS companies i think causal is a great case study there like any SaaS company that is doing any kind of software in there even for your guys your guys itself like are you guys using byword for for byword uh we haven't actually uh and the reason for that just is because uh the topic that byword deals with ai seo is so novel that um, I, I mean, like a lot of AI or language model based tools, that it will suffer from kind of knowledge cutoffs. And so, realistically, when you're trying to do something that's fairly new and cutting edge, uh, yeah, it's it's not the best for that kind of content. Um, but what would be some like software companies that you think, like for let's say in, uh, Apollo, like the sales software, like how would they apply like e leveraging bi Byword? Because you know, a lot of the founders I'd say in, in the community run either a software company, um, e-commerce slash D2C consumer brand, or, you know, it's a B2B type agency. It could be like sales, marketing operations or HR. I can definitely see like the, the founders in our community that are running, like if you're running a retail business, for sure, this is like no brainer. Like the stuff that you're talking about with like, let's say they run a, like a chain of flower stores or a chain of restaurants or something and then running something locally. Um, and just doing it at scale without paying hundreds of or thousands of dollars for content top of funnel. It's just a no brainer. Yeah. Um, so maybe one example, and I hope you won't mind mentioning this, but I have a friend who's uh, launching a sort of PNL automation SaaS. Uh, it's just an example of kind of any sort of SaaS. Um, and there's a few ideas we were chatting about in terms of uh, the sort of things that someone looking for that might be searching for. So we were discussing one kind of big programmatic idea of like, can I business expense this, where this is a kind of list of thousands, potentially of, of different sorts of uh, expensable items. And so even if it's not kind of hugely directly related to the actual product of kind of PNL automation, it's close enough that it's targeting people who are in market 
um, who maybe aren't ready to kind of go and purchase straight away, but are, are you're kind of building a uh, topical domain authority with and also building brand recognition with also. And so I think for a lot of these these SaaS softwares, there are those sort of topics that are, are close enough and relevant that it's worth generating this content for. From a framework perspective, they should think about like, uh, can they, can they do like versus articles? Because those are pretty like popular ones, like their, their software versus other ones, or maybe um, their software versus, uh, not versus, but like their software for a specific category, if there's like something that's hundreds or thousands that they want to rank for, like long form type uh, content, but like a lot of different uh, pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some kind of provisos here that I mentioned earlier around knowledge cutoffs and a lot of tools suffering from, from the same sort of issues there. Um, so as long as it's not kind of super topical, I, I've seen a few of these use cases with Bioweb before. Okay. And then how about like e-commerce, like consumer brands? Uh, yeah, sure. I think it comes down to, it depends on the sort of brand. Um, I think within any of these brands, there will be a large space of kind of question-based uh, search terms that it's possible to go after. Um, and especially the more niche ones that you can, you can pick at by getting these programmatic type structures. Um, those are two dimensional ones I mentioned earlier. There, I think it's particularly true that the sort of people searching the more niche questions that you can afford to go after with a tool like Byword are the ones who are most likely to be in market and ready to buy an e-commerce product. I think there's definitely an application there. And then, uh, even for like example, for cave mines, like for us, like we were creating content and le- wanting to leverage Byward more to create like, you know, that top of funnel stuff for, for AI in the category. Like what would you like off the top of your head would be like, think that it's like super key for us to focus on. Yeah. I mean, in truth, this is kind of goes back to what I said earlier and the reason why it's difficult to use Byword for Byword itself, which is that AI is such a, a fast changing topic. It, it's also not come out of nowhere and that there's a lot of training data out there on, on artificial intelligence, which, you and I both know changes every month at the moment. So is maybe a difficult topic to, to, to use for a content generation tool like Byword. I'd say like, uh, one of the biggest objections people might have. And I think that's like, it's like the double edged sword where it's like Byword lists, like people, brands generate like thousands of articles a day in like minutes of work. And they might be thinking like, this sounds too good to be true. And the leading thing that we're going to is like, will I be penalized for this by the Google gods or like the search engine gods? And you guys have addressed this, but I think like just hearing it from you, like expanding on it, um, what, what would that, what does that look like? And like, how are you guys like preventing that with the software or dealing with that? Yeah. So I think something important to say, first of all, and Google have their own kind of guidance and blog posts on this is that Google just don't really care if your content is AI generated or not. There's this sort of moralizing fear of like, I'm going to be caught out by the teacher if I've handed in my AI generated essay, but Google's not a moralizer. It's not a teacher. It doesn't care about the means of production. It cares about good searcher experience. And if you have content that's relevant um, and it answers the question that a searcher is making, then Google has no commercial or moral incentive to, to care about how the content's produced, just that the content is the right thing to serve the user. Um, you can sort of look at the, the rise, the sharp rise of ChatGPT as a response potentially to how bad Google is answering some long tail search queries. If you're looking for a list of the 10 best credit cards in the US or something, Google's amazing at that. But if you're looking for credit cards for like a specific financial situation for like a two person family in Missouri or whatever, um, that's where Google comes much less good uh, or any of these kind of more niche questions. Um, and so you can, you can almost make the case that Google would much rather have the content there be AI generated or not, rather than to lose that search experience and traffic to something like ChatGPT. Um, in terms of kind of more practical experience with how we handle this stuff, so I, I should come out and say that I get asked this question by uh, all sorts of different site owners and people who own different sort of domain uh, authorities. A domain authority just being a kind of rank of how trusted your site is by Google, how well established it is. And generally, when someone comes along and they have a very fresh site that doesn't have any backlinks, so it's quite low authority, um, usually kind of domain authority below 10 or 5 on a 100-point scale. Usually, um, I, I think it's fine to use Byword at small scale, but I'm a bit cautious about kind of going unlimited, generating thousands of articles. I think that's potentially quite high risk and sends a signal to Google, not because the content's AI generated, but more just because there's so much content on a fresh domain that Google hasn't seen before, that that domain is high risk and that there might be penalties applied. With all of the projects that I've been working on uh, prior to Byword when I was doing this as a, as a contractor consultant, we're working on sites that had at least 20, 30 DA. Uh, the, the, the causal site, I think, was around DA40 when we started, which is a 
a pretty healthy SaaS startup authority. Uh, and we were pumping quite a lot of content. I think the most was, was 5,000 in one day. Um, and that was all indexed pretty much straight away within 24 hours. So I think if you have that domain authority um, and you're generating stuff that is kind of reasonable in the context of your site, like it's it's on topic and relevant to your target audience, then I, I really haven't seen any issues in terms of producing large amounts of content. That's a good point. And for, for brands that are watching this that maybe you're like, for whatever reason, you're, you're a big e-commerce brand, but you just haven't focused on content and your DA just happened to be Z like five to 10, like Mag was just talking about. Like, what would you recommend? Would it just be to start slow uh, or create more like long form content and then start adding in the top of funnel stuff? Yeah, I, I don't know if it comes down to content so much as just building authority overall. So um, this is just building links. It's doing PR type of stuff like this. Um, interestingly, with Causal, we'd noticed that um, being a, a venture back SaaS, they would uh, have fundraise announcements. And when you have a fundraise announcement, you get an absolute ton of press and backlinks and stuff which leads to an increase in domain authority. Uh, and this has a sort of kind of rising for sea levels effect on all the content because it, it, it signals to Google that the site and the domain as a whole is more authoritative. Uh, and so it provides a, song, a stronger signal to rank that content. Um, so it's, it's just things like that. And it'll be unique to your brand. There's no kind of single playbook for how to, to build authority. Um, but yeah, I, I'd focus on that rather than kind of using content as a way to get to more content or to get to the point where you can start posting more content. There we go. That makes sense. And there's a lot of, um, for those watching, like there's a lot of things you can go on like Moz, Ahrefs, um, probably some tools Mac recommend to like check your DA right now and then just continue to monitor it as you kind of build out your your uh, content and SEO. Um, so this would be a good transition to like talking about like what you view as the future of content marketing and SEO with AI. Like what's your what's your outlook overall on the industry as a whole? Yeah, I guess there's a few points to bring up. So one is that in this sort of like first wave of AI content tools, uh, I think everyone's, for understandable reasons, has has tried to go quite broad in terms of building tools that kind of fit all use cases. I think it's likely to some extent you'll see a degree of specialization going forward because every site is different. Every site wants different types of content. And it's maybe unrealistic to think that one tool could uh, could really kind of completely consolidate and clean up and, and, and cover all sorts of content use cases. And so I think that you'll certainly see tools go down kind of more specialist angles around certain types of content, or you might see sort of uh, e-commerce first, like generators that focus on kind of linking through to product pages and stuff like this. Um, and certainly like part of the BioWare roadmap uh, is looking at what, what I've been calling custom formats. So ways of building kind of more specialized articles for certain use cases, be this kind of glossary based articles or programmatic articles and stuff like this. So I think that's quite an important part. Um, I, I, I'd be surprised if it went down the avenue of just kind of the biggest player takes all and kind of sweeps up all of the volume. Because I think the the nature of content out there is just so diverse that it's almost difficult to solve for with, with just one tool. Okay, that makes sense. And then do you like as like as you're running by where like what's what's your ideal outcome now? Is it to build like the biggest like SEO AI as you guys evolve? Is it to acquire other things? Is it to exit? Like what 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 are your thoughts on it now? For today, yeah, sure. Um, the, the honest answer is, I tend to think fairly short term in a sense of I just want to make the product as good as it possibly can be, build features that other people haven't figured out how to build or, or won't have built. So, like the interlinking feature I mentioned earlier. And I, I guess my belief is just that if I keep making the product as good as possible, then everything else will follow. Um, so it's definitely quite product led growth in that sense. That's solid. Uh, and then. Some rapid fire things actually. So what are you paying attention to when it comes to AI? What, what gets you excited? This is a slightly cop out answer, but the answer is sort of everything in the sense that certainly whenever something new drops in an open AI update email, you just know there's going to be this huge, uh, rush of kind of people trying to get that first mover advantage and being the first to market with either a new product or if it's kind of related to, to SEO and content, I, I being the first one to kind of generate that feature. Um, with what's now possible. Um, and I think if I, if I didn't have Byword and I, I, I didn't kind of have any product or anything, my strategy would probably be just kind of refreshing my email, waiting for, for new models to come out and just trying to be ready and to be the first one to build something that, that kind of takes advantage, uh, of the gap of what's now possible through APIs versus kind of what, what users can do easily. 
uh, and trying to kind of arbitrage that essentially. Very cool. And then what what are the what do you think are since you've been like doing in the space for uh, like building like bubble and also looking at things with AI, like what are the missed business opportunities or business problems uh, within AI right now that you see are unsolved? Just like how you built like byword AI for SEO. This kind of goes back to something I was mentioning earlier, and maybe it doesn't answer the question directly, but in terms of uh, a lot of products, say, and this is probably true for like a lot of different product areas, but certainly within kind of content and SEO, a lot of products are getting quite broad. And you could say Byword does this as well, in that it's trying to, you know, when you sign up to Byword, you enter a, a keyword that you want to rank for, and it generates the article. And it's very, in a sense, at first, quite agnostic as to sort of the use case, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think there's a, a bit of an untapped market for people who are building more specialized content type stuff. So I kind of alluded to one example earlier of if it's people building like Shopify first content where it's not just about kind of writing the article, but like the key differentiator is that, hey, this links up really well with the, shot of, with the Shopify product catalog um, on, on a merchant site because this is still like a frontier where I think humans have like a strong upper hand. Um, but I also think that a product that's very kind of heads down, focused, and dedicated on just solving that one problem could probably do pretty well. Um, but equally, it's unlikely that I would build something that's dedicated to that with Byword because Byword is it's more of an agnostic tool in that sense. That makes sense. And what do you think founders and, and business operators right now are missing when it comes to AI? I, I, would, I wouldn't say this is so much missing, but like one point that you, you touched on earlier around building with Bubble. Um, so for people who don't know, Bubble is a, a, a basically a no-code platform. It's like a kind of visual um, web app builder. And I th- I think even though it's very popular and kind of well-known in some circles, it still gets a little bit overlooked in the sense that um, truly technical people don't want to use it because they think it's it's dumbing down. Um, they'd rather just kind of write the code themselves. At the same time, I think that technical people are the people who can get the most out of it. Because Bubble, the, the way Byword's built, it, it's basically Bubble on the kind of front end and database. And then we have a bunch of uh, GCP, Google Cloud platform architecture in the background. Um, so it's using, like, I, I have some technical skills and it's using the technical skills in that sense. But on the front end, like, especially in the context of AI, speed of delivery is so important. And so being able to, like, abstract a lot of that away and just leave that to Bubble so you can get the front end up, up and running really quickly. And then the differentiating factor is is kind of in the back end when you're kind of building prompts and the architecture around that, that's where you can afford to really spend the time. So especially in context of how I mentioned earlier, there's this huge first mover advantage when new things become possible with new models. If you're able to just speed up the front end and all of that side of things and just focus on the actual kind of value delivering stuff uh, that does take some technical skill, um, then I think Bubble is really good for that and, and is particularly suited to this sort of AI arms race. So that's a that's a key. We're gonna put a key note on that because that that part's really key for like founders that are if you're looking at like looking at AI solutions for your own company, um, you know, being like a first mover and actually jumping on bubble like Mac and like actually building something that solves a problem and then is scalable and is able to like really like be at the and really understanding. I think to really understand AI as well, you have to be able to do what Mac has done and just like go in and actually like build something leverage all the LM tools, put things together, like trial and error, and then like really figure it out. And then things work out sometimes like for you guys. Um, The last one I got for you is what's your best source for AI news or just not news, sorry, but just AI overall. Like how do you guys keep up to date? Like what, what's the number one way that you guys look at every day when you wake up? Yeah. Good question. It's, it's honestly a bit of a mix. Um, I probably spend a little bit too much time on Twitter, um, and don't get it from any particular source. Just, I, I think it knows, it knows me well enough to know that I'm interested in, you know, people sharing prompts and stuff like that. Um, it's, I, it's also quite helpful that I have a lot of friends who are building similar sorts of things, or even if they're building kind of non AI products that everyone's got some sort of AI feature nowadays. Um, and so being able to kind of share back and forth with someone that you trust rather than kind of posting all your stuff on Twitter or whatever. Um, especially seeing, yeah, because let's take prompt engineering, just the practice of kind of writing good prompts, because there's a degree of kind of secrecy and confidentiality and not sharing this stuff. People kind of develop in their very own ways in a kind of like, they don't tend to share stuff too much and it can be a bit insular, which is interesting when, you know, you and a friend kind of learn this stuff on your own. And then maybe one day you come together and you'll kind of share prompts back and forth. And it's interesting to see the styles and techniques that they've developed 
um, that you can learn from and also the things that you've developed that they might not have. And so it's very interesting to kind of be able to share with people that you trust in, in that sort of way too. Is it, very cool. And is there a book or a person that you follow particularly that come to mind? I mean, there's quite a few people, certainly in the early days of, of all this stuff, I used to read a, you know, scroll through the Riley Goodside tweets. Uh, Michael Taylor is a, Mike Taylor is a good friend of mine. Uh, he's, he's writing a book on prompt engineering and he does a bunch of courses on, particularly on some of the image stuff, which I, I tend to look at a little bit less, but I trust the judgment a lot and it often kind of highlights new things that are available there that could be of interest to buy word too. So those are, yeah, those are two. Okay, nice. We'll, we'll, we'll show something up there, um, here. And then, uh, and then as I just had one more thing where you, you built by were like fully on your own. Like it's just you, Jake. What's the team kind of look like? And then like as you guys are evolving as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, you pretty much just described it. It's, it's mostly me. Um, I'm, or at least on the kind of like day to day, it's me doing, uh, products and a little bit of customer support and, and planning like that. Uh, and Jake handles a lot of the marketing side of things. So not just what you see on LinkedIn. Uh, but a lot of work kind of behind the scenes in terms of planning stuff out, uh, building relationships with, with other brands and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty lean team. We have like maybe one or two contractors that we we'll use for certain things. Like we're trying to put together more sort of video content uh, and become a bit of an authority within the educational side of AI driven SEO. And so we'll kind of use people for that. In terms of people who are, who are full time involved, it's, it's really just me and Jake. Wow. That's impressive. Like it, it's, that's not easy. And then especially like if you guys were to, you know, I always think about like, what's the alternative and like the amount of stuff you guys have generated in the traction, like, like if you didn't have like the, uh, if I were to create these content, how much humans would you have needed to create the level of content is like probably hundreds of people in the span of the amount of time you guys have needed versus with technology. So I think that that's really impressive, especially like just like keeping things lean and growing and stuff. That's like the smart way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, there's an extent to which you could say, you know, maybe we'd develop the product faster uh, with kind of more developers or whatever, but certainly having it all very lean and like I'm extremely dedicated to it and spend a lot of time on the product, it means that we can have like a very consistent vision, ship stuff quickly. Um, and so it cuts a lot of overhead in that sense too. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode of the Cave Minds podcast. I really appreciate you for taking the time to listen to the AI insights, the golden nuggets, the value. And I hope you got a lot of that from this conversation that we had. We're going to be interviewing a lot more amazing AI founders, startups, experts, bringing you these deeper insights so that you can apply it to your company and take it to the next level and adapt it for the age of AI. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe, download this episode, tell all your founder colleagues and friends about it. We do this all for free. You're getting every single thing with the deep dives, the podcast, the one workshops, all in an effort to adapt our businesses and help us grow together as part of the community. Last thing I'd like to ask, please leave a review if you can. Something that's one, two sentences. It helps us rank higher so that more people can find out about us. And then it also means a lot when you're able to take about five, 10 seconds to leave a nice two, three sentence review for us as well. I look forward to seeing you in the next podcast episode and where we're going to keep making things even better, more valuable for you. Thanks again. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the Cave Minds podcast. The only podcast founders and CEOs need to integrate and leverage AI into their businesses. Every week, we sift through the buzz and serve you crystal clear insights that you can plug into your business today. Visit our website, caveminds.com, for show details and many more products. This show is copyrighted by Cave Minds. Written admission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.